Welcome back to the BBG Fantasy Football Channel. Today we are playing a little buy, sell, hold based on current draft prices on Underdog Fantasy. As always, I'm joined by Mr. Adam and Mr. Andrew over there. The way this works, if you are new to the channel, is each of us will nominate a single player. We'll tell you where they're currently being drafted, some players around them. And then the other two will write on the whiteboard whether they are buying at that price, whether they are holding at that price, or whether they are selling slash fading at that price price and if you are new to underdog that is where you draft your best ball teams and you can do a shitload of them you never have to do waiver wire or trade action or sit start they just draft a big ass team and start the best players every single week on the platform it is smooth it is flawless it is beautiful like adam's beard over there looking <laughs> we love you looking extra cute this morning all gray nah, nah a little bit of gray a little, little. A little bit of gray yeah just just a touch of gray More touch of nice. gray speaking of which Let's, what are we touching on? Who's the, who's the, who's chill, the first? Chill, I ain't touching Let me on see nobody. I'm trying, to hold, I'm trying to hold it. Okay, let's uh, let's jump right in. My marker. So Listen, that's because you don't write anything. Hold the notes. first player I'm going to nominate is a running back from the AFC North. Ooh, Jalen Warren. Mm. Jalen Warren is the <sighs> 90th pick overall. Running back 24 now. Of course, on underdog, there is always a premium to, towards wide receivers. So wide receivers around him probably won't be as enticing. So I kind of wanted to get more into the actual running backs going on in his area because you look at Jalen Warren and Cortland Sutton's behind him, wide receiver. Curtis Samuel's behind him at wide receiver. James Williams ahead of him at wide receiver. So I think we probably all want Jalen Warren over those guys mm -hmm. at the position. But you have Joe Burrow going one pick ahead of him. You have Zamir White and Jonathan Brooks, two picks ahead of him. And you have DeAndre Swift and Zach Moss behind him. So, Jalen Warren, RB24, pick 90, which is approximately uh, middle of the eighth round, I believe. How are we feeling about J-Dubs? Much like when I'm getting ready to leave the day, it's time to pack your shit. So. Ooh, spicy. A couple cells here. I was leaning between hold and sell, but you said uh, a couple guys underneath him, like DeAndre Pause. Swift and stuff, that... <laughs> crazy uh that i would just rather have so uh i guess at this cost i lean the guys behind him a little bit more and not that i dislike jalen warren i think he's gonna be fine in this offense we all have talked very at length about how much we like Najee harris but yeah man i, I warren's fine but give me i, I don't want him at this cost i mean i don't really have a whole lot to add other than like i, I feel like from the efficiency standpoint this whole last year like a lot of the warren truthers were kind of standing up and, and celebrating and i get it but he he ba they basically split the backfield. And Arthur Smith has a tendency to uh, lean more on a guy like Najee Harris's build. And I feel like there's a better than, I would say it's a realistic case where, I'm not going to say it's it crazy, but let's even say it's like a 60-40 split. If I got a guy that's 40%, even closer to 50, over some of those running backs you named behind, where they could end up being the 1A for the whole season for their team. I just don't understand the price other than we we like the efficiency of this player and we're hoping he's going to get more touches. Yeah, it's weird because when I look at the list of, of uh, running backs, as you guys were saying, I like the ones going behind him more than I like the ones going in front of him. Like, in front of Warren is Zamir White, Jonathan Brooks, uh, Najee Harris, Ramondre Stevenson, Aaron Jones. I'd almost swap them directly, like flip-flop them for the dudes, DeAndre Swift, Zach Moss, James Conner, Raheem Mostert, Tony Pollard behind yep. him. Like legitimately, I think I would swap those five for those five. Maybe not Najee, but Warren's a, a tough one to get behind only because especially in this format, it's half PPR. He doesn't score a ton of touchdowns. Arthur Smith coming over does mean the offense will probably run through the backs. Jalen yeah, Warren sneaky had 225 opportunities last year. Yeah, that was yeah. that was a big, uh, big workload. He was great in the passing game, but it is it is hard to talk yourself into upside given like Najee's not going anywhere. He's no. still going to be the guy that they run through in the backfield. So yeah, Jalen Warren. I think I'm a hold here. I think I'm okay at that price, but like you said, I like other backs ahead of him that are behind him, but I do like him probably above some of the backs in front of him. So he's, he's kind of a hold for me here. If I didn't have as much conviction about some of the guys behind him, obviously we mentioned James Conner. Like, where, do you, where do you have Jalen Warren ranked in season long? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but he's somewhere between like 27 and 31, 32. I think I, I have him too. early 30s. Okay. I think I like originally when I did my rank because I had him like 25, 26. And then I think I've slowly kind of moved him down a little bit yeah, I think towards like 27, 28. Yeah, he's sitting in that like 27 to 30 range. Just yeah. It, it's tough because, you know, when you look at the efficiency metrics, he does end up being one of those dudes who's 
top five in like yards created and yards right, per touch, right. which which a lot of it is is skewed towards the fact that the majority of your touches came in the passing game. Like obviously yards per touch is going to be much higher. It's very similar to like Austin Eckler's numbers early on when it's like, oh, Eckler's is like wildly efficient, but like he'll never get the workload. He was top five in, you know, yards created, yards per touch, all that kind of shit. Melvin Gordon is out and then Eckler gets that chance. So it's like, I don't see a path where Najee Harris is out outside of just like random injury, of course. So it's like, where is the real path to it? But Warren, I, he's great in a, a limited sample size, but it is hard to talk yourself into anything more. Yeah. It's funny, we were talking on a separate video today about 60-yard runs. I remember, I think there was two weeks in a row where Warren popped, like, really yeah. long runs for touchdowns. Yeah. Saquon, like, literally could never. He couldn't even dream. Here's, Not even in his prime. Here's but, one, speaking oh, of prime, prime Saquon. It's okay, what do you got? Uh, I just was going to say, I don't really wow. see the a ego on this guy just major, fucking interrupting is crazy. crazy. I, know. I don't <laughs> see a, a major difference between like a Jalen Warren and a Tajay Spears and Tajay's 10 running backs behind him. Dude, so I was looking at both the numbers and Tajay's like the exact same way. He's also yeah. like top five in yards created, yards per touch. I'm like, we got a couple little Ecklers fucking mm. rumbling in the, in the pit right now. Which one of them's getting unleashed Stumbling. this year? So it's just, yeah, at cost selling. I'm looking though. What's crazy is all that efficiency, all the hype that he was building. He was running back 30 in points per game. So, like, yeah. what is, what's going to happen this year, I guess? Or where, why are we projecting him to be better this season? Is it, uh, to me, it's got to be opportunity. Or he's going to pop more long runs. He's going to be more efficient. Like, yeah. I just don't understand it. Because uh, the Jalen Warren I can't see the hype upside is either. crazy. Sell him. Get rid of his him. ass. He's gone. Sorry, not sorry, brother. Here you go. Mark me. Mark me up, dog. I'm only sorry because Alrighty. I should have been louder. Well, for my first one. Talk to me. I want to talk a little bit about Tank Dell. Ooh. Wide receiver for the Houston Texans. Averaged 15 fantasy points per game last year, was 18th best in the NFL. But you look at his underdog ADP right now, he is being drafted at the 34.5. That is a third round pick for Tank Dell in these underdog drafts. Sheesh. You look at the wide receivers around Tank Dell, just above him DJ Moore, Cooper Cup, Stephon Diggs, Michael Pittman Jr. Just below him, Zay Flowers and T. Higgins. Some other cross positional players would be like the tight end one, Sam Laporta. QB1, Josh Allen, Kyron Williams, Derrick Henry. These are the types of guys around Tank Dell. So what are we doing with him in our redrafts? I don't even have to just leave this writing up here. Sell Dell. Sell Dell. Get the hell out of here, Tank Dell. So Dell is like an 1,100-yard receiver trapped in an 800-yard situation. That's like kind of what it feels like to me. You know, it's like people are like, oh, I'm an old soul trapped in a young body kind of thing. That's where Dell is. Like anyone could see here, it's not fucking news to say that Tank Dell is a really talented wide receiver. It's just so hard to talk yourself into a target share that's above like 18% in that fucking offense between digs coming in. Nico being a downfield playmaker, Dalton Schultz getting re-signed, so he's going to be a red zone target. Joe Mixon coming in, who's probably going to be a back that they feel pretty comfortable with giving 18 opportunities per game. It's like something's got to give here, and it might be a little bit of give from everyone. And it might be, they might have 1,000-yard receiver. They might have two that crack it, but like talent-wise, he's not the odd man out, but I just, I do feel like they probably feel more comfortable with the veterans that they have in Nico and Diggs being the guys that play the most snaps Are this we year. all in unison with that? Like, it should be Nico and Diggs in that order in your redress? That's that's where I'm at, yeah. I'm willing to go, I don't it's not on a limb. I'm, I'm willing to put Nico at one. I would lean Diggs, but I feel like it's, I'm, I'm kind of split on it. I'm, ta- yeah, I'm, I'm not, like, over honest. the top about it, but. This might be a hot. I would, I would lean Diggs, though. This might be hot takey. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be shocked if Diggs led that team this year in fantasy points. Oh, okay. Wow. I'd be a little surprised. I was going to say, tar- I thought you were going to say targets, fantasy points. Okay. I-, I wouldn't be shocked if he did. Like, just a one year, like, we brought him in. We want to utilize him, try and make a run at a bowl. But yeah, I, 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 I think wouldn't be super the only shocked. problem I have with that is, like, this offense is going to be so explosive downfield, and he feels like the third best downfield playmaker now at Fair. wide receiver position. Fair. So, like, if CJ Shroud takes. Five deep shots a game. I feel like two of them are Nico, two of them are Tank. Maybe one of them is Diggs. But maybe Diggs is getting you know seven or eight PPR points from these little short crossing sure. routes and things like that. That could yeah. score more points than a guy yeah. like full PPR. Yeah, maybe. And oh. it's kind of just like a matter of like where the touchdowns break. You yeah, know, does, does eight, sure. nine of them go to Diggs and seven to Nico or something like 20 that? Twenty to Joe Mixon. Fucking forty to Mixon. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> NFL record. Priest okay. Holmes, all them done. I mean, so I, don't both, really, I, don't really, I don't really have much to say on Tank other than... It, 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 he I feel had, good, like, the first year that Diggs is out of there, like, I'm like, okay, Tank will go for, you know, 1,100 or something like that, but I just I can't get there right now. It's he's a, he's a little too high for me. There's some players going ahead behind him that I would prefer, Mari Cooper, um, but... Who do you like, Tank or Zay? 
Um, I, I think that there's I, a, a much safer floor back. was a. I think that the upside probably actually leans uh, possibly to Tank, though. I like, think, yeah. The hard part about Tank is his sample size last year was weird. And right before he got hurt at the end there, this dude was getting, like, absolutely peppered with targets. Yeah. So, like, I, that's why I say I lean digs, but it wouldn't surprise me also if Tank Dell just ends up being a guy that is a preferred choice for C.J. Stroud. Dude, you said the old soul in a young body. That's a Rottweiler in a Chihuahua body in Tank yeah. Dell. You dog. You dog. Big dog. Her, her. But All what right. the hell, <laughs> sell <laughs> Tank <it>. Dell? <laughs> All right. We'll see if we can keep the sale train going. See if we can get your boys. I'm buying no matter what. There's just no. Oh, I I, ho- I pray that you do. <laughs> Justin Herbert. <laughs> Buy, sell, hold. These One nuts. T. Higgins. Wide receiver 27. Uh, the 39.4, which is the 404. Wide receivers going in the range. It's actually interesting. Very similar to Tank Dell. So it's Tank Dell, Zay Flowers, T. Higgins, George Pickens, Amari Cooper, Christian Kirk. Um, after him are running backs Pacheco, uh, ETN, and James Cook. Can you can you say the f- ones just above him again? The wide receivers. Certainly, Tank Dell, Tank Dell, Zay Flowers, Michael Pittman. <sighs> okay. Show him. Mm, I huh. knew you couldn't buy. He's a hold for me. I'll, I'll draft him there if he if he's if he's there at the four hundred four. I'm looking for. I'm holding, but I'm leaning towards buy a little bit. I I think I, I wish would go we knew the same the, way. I wish we knew the rules of this game. I like it. There you are can rules. just write whatever the hell no you rules want in a fucking talk, jungle. Talk, talk to me though. Why? why so, where, where does it? Where, why lean? Where? What's the difference between hold and lean buy? What, what do you mean? I, I'm holding and I'm leaning by because I would say aside from a few of those players, I do prefer Higgins over most of them. Okay. So even though he's probably closely properly evaluated, I guess I, I do think that I might click draft on him at that draft position more than I'm not clicking. Yeah. That's what, that's kind of so, where I'm at too. That that probably was a horrible way to say it, but like a couple of guys, like I think Pacheco and Pittman, like definitely I'll take those two. But outside of those two, I'm probably gonna draft Higgins over Dell. I'll draft Higgins over a Zay, Zay Flowers or a Amari. Amari, yeah, I'm gonna draft him over those guys. I just think yeah. there's more upside with. I kind of think the narrative has gone pretty far with T Higgins about how he's like, and I get it. You know, you look at his actual box scores year over year, and he's really not getting above 1100 yards he's not scoring you know more than like seven touchdowns ish a year mm-hmm. I, I think the Cincinnati offense though and maybe it's something that's not talked about we talk about Joe Mixon going over Houston but like Tyler Boyd is gone and Joe Mixon are gone those are two those are, yeah. have been two staple weapons where I think the fact that Joe Mixon is gone you're replacing him with Zach Moss this could be a much uh more pass heavy offense and obviously yeah. Chase will eat in that situation but so will T Higgins so like I I don't think anyone's really leaving room for this passing offense to be like really putting it together this year, and T will be a beneficiary. So I, I think also, not a buy there, but like if he falls to me at his ADP, and I'm like need a wide receiver, no problem with him there. I also would say too, like in a best ball format, especially like here on mm-hmm. Underdog, when I'm chasing spike weeks, yep. I think Higgins can give me more spike weeks than some of those guys as well. For sure, I was that was going to be my point is that. Uh, really, you guys look at him as a, like a spike week player. For some reason, he's not that. that, that, that I, I think, think he I can think that's boom. the misconception that is why he's twenty seven. It's like uh, a lot of the weeks that he either leaves early or doesn't do anything. T Higgins, the last two years, I think has had at least four weeks of top five finishes. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me fact check myself. But so I remember last year felt like just a throwaway season for him. Dude, he had but, so many right, bad so I'm, games. I, I can't, all right. So wide Wait. receiver. He was wide receiver four. All right, so he only had one top five, but he was wide receiver four, wide receiver eight, wide receiver 10, wide receiver 10 okay. in four different weeks. 2022, he was – he had a wide receiver five, four, six, and four finishes. Last uh, year – But the problem is they get sprinkled in with, like, wide receiver 30 range. Yep. Uh, yeah. When he, he doesn't he, he, is, he is kind of all over the place, which you don't feel like he is because he's a possession guy. He's like, okay, he's going to get his targets, get his production, whatever. But he is – and a lot of it has been, like – Joe Burrow's health has been completely volatile. Jamar Chase has missed a bunch of time. T. Higgins has missed a bunch of time. Like, they've kind of been all over the place, and we've seen no stability. But if we get all of them together for a full year without mixing in Tyler Boyd, like, I feel like we could see something kind of special out there. The other, yeah. the other thing that, about T that I think uh, – he, he also is one of those guys that's like, if you tell me wide receivers that are going to have over 100 yards and then also that big body presence where they could get, like, two or three touchdowns, he's, the, he's that guy. They throw yeah. – throw, Joe Burrow just throw it to him in the end zone. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I could buy that though, just because he never finishes that many touchdowns. I think his. I think his career high is like what eight at this point. Oh, let's see. Yeah, if that seven six six seven so fucking eight. five seven six six. Yep. Yeah, it's like. But like here, like me, you want to think he is that red zone guy, but, no, but like, like so last year he had two games with two touchdowns. Yeah. Uh, year prior, actually didn't have a multi touchdown game. So I mean, 
I guess that's that's a fair fair counterpoint. It's just hard. He's just one of those guys I feel like you're going to look back. You kind of know what you're getting. You're going to look back, and you won't be disappointed. Uh, last year was disappointing, I think, but it was mostly injury-related uh, for the most part. So It's it's really hard to look at what he did last year and really give that any type of validity. Especially because he's still a young player. The, yeah. The, 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 also, with last year, it's like Burrow was playing hurt for the majority of the season. Yeah. So it's yeah. – I, I get it. It's, yeah, I think we could throw a last year in the watch because, it, it, again, it's not like we're coming in this year. He's like, oh, he's 29, and now we have all these questions. It's like, nah, the first few years were probably what T. Higgins is, not what that bullshit was last year. Yep, agreed. Speak. All right, preach. Talking about that old bullshit at wide receiver. Talked about this guy a little bit in our uh, favorite players to draft round by round. He wasn't one of, the, one of the players, but I did bring him up for some conversation, and that is Keenan Allen. Mm. Wide receiver, 33 right now. 53rd overall, so you're talking about a fifth-round pick. The wide receivers going above him. The three above him are Christian Kirk, Terry McLaurin, Hollywood Brown. Three below him are Jaden Reed, Calvin Ridley, and Chris Godwin. So, again, wide receiver, 33. Last year, he finished as a top-five fantasy wide receiver. Obviously, switching situations, switching teams from L.A., to Chicago, switching QBs, switching systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Has the hate gone too far? Let me get a little, let me get a little action. Let me go ahead I'm and holding. buy something. A little buy action? Buy it. Talk okay. to me, Adam. I just think the case for Keenan Allen is, Caleb Williams, let's just call it what it is. We, we, his situation, being surrounded by this many weapons, you don't ever see a number one pick, really, with that type of thing. We just talked yeah. about Joe Burrow. They had T. Higgins and nothing. They had no offensive line. So, a lot of times I think, though, a one number one overall pick is going to be looking early on to a guy that's like Keenan Allen, going to get open in short yardage, separates really well in the slot, and I think that's going to be a guy that gets a lot of volume from uh, Caleb Williams. And if you're telling me that, like, in years past recently, Keenan Allen is going to be a, a, a featured focal point of an offense that teams are trying to do what they can to take away and zone whatever they have to do. There's no way you can even do that with this offense. Yeah. I feel like at this price, the other thing was we, you name the players behind, like Jaden Reed, Calvin Ridley, Chris Godwin, and then his teammate Rome. Like I don't feel like any of these guys have the upside that Keenan Allen still probably does, even though we don't really know what the role for certain is going to be. So I feel like at this price in the 30s, I'm, I'm shooting my shot. I'm taking Reed over Keenan Allen. Um, oh, okay. But I do think – the reason why I put hold is because the names that you mentioned above him, like the George Pickens, Amari Cooper, Christian Kirk, like I do take those guys over. To be fair, those guys are going like 10-ish spots. Those, those guys are significantly above him, though. Who? Like I, Terry and Hollywood are way closer to Keenan. Fair. Right. Uh, so where he's currently at, like I, I'm holding him here. I, we talked about it a little bit. I don't want to dive too much into Keenan Allen because I talked to him or I talked about it on our worst picks video but people want to hear for this i one. just can't well they should go watch the other one uh, <laughs> but i what i Damn. zesty <laughs> speak Sorry. to him i just i can't see myself drafting a ton of keenan allen right now at this current cost like i, I like the other players in this tier a little bit more um that are not wide receiver i mean you talk about even like a james cook a josh jacobs a joe mixon like i would rather draft them than I would have yeah, Keenan Allen. Yeah, for sure. I, I, again, I think like when you're talking about underdog and then we go into like redraft <clears throat> mindset, the running backs are easy picks over over them when we're not in underdog format. But I, I yeah, I, I look at like the, like there's no chance of taking Hollywood Brown over Keenan Allen. I think Terry's probably a good conversation. I think the guy, Jaden Reed's a good conversation. Anyone behind them though, I would take Keenan over. Yeah. I think one of the biggest question marks is like, DJ Moore feels like the one. He'll play the most yep. snaps at wide receiver. What happens in two wide receiver sets when it's only two perimeter wide receivers from weeks 8 to 16? Is, does Rome become more of sure. an outside wide receiver? Because, you know, with JSN, the problem last year was, like, he was pretty much a slot wide receiver only. And he did that in college. And so when you go to two wide receiver sets and you have – these boundary players in Lockett and DK Metcalf, there's not a lot of room for you to play on two wide receiver sets. Keenan, I would say, at this point in his career, is probably just a better slot wide receiver, where Rome is probably a better outside wide receiver. So I, I do wonder, like, how that tandem develops and, like, how they start to circulate, you know, the snap share for the wide receiver. So I could see second half of the year, maybe some funky shit starts going on. You know, you brought up rookie quarterbacks. Their stats are typically not, like, groundbreaking stats. So how much yardage and production do we really have going around altogether? It, it, it's a tough one to make the case for. Uh, again, I take most of the running backs over him, and also in the middle of the fifth round is where I'm taking tight ends for the most part, Kincaid or Andrews or whoever's available here. But amongst the wide receiver position, I feel I feel pretty good where he's at, and I would almost probably lean towards having him as a buy just within the wide receiver positional just, rankings. 
to kind of give you an idea, I just looked up Jaden Reed and Keenan Allen in my current exposures. I have about 11% more Jaden Reed than I do Keenan Allen, so I am just naturally It does feel like Jayden when Reed. I'm drafting, Jaden Reed goes, their ADP is one and a half picks apart, but it always feels like if you want Keenan, you need him in the fifth. If you want Jaden Reed, you can usually get him in the sixth. Yep. But I guess the numbers are lying. Yeah. Or I'm, I'm lying. Well, yeah, you <laughs> the just, people you're you just drafting, you're just, you just yeah. taking them. Yeah. You, just, you, yeah. you yapping too. I mean, I think I've kind of made the case for it. I, I think that Jaden Reed has pretty similar concerns for me. Um, been diving into some snaps here stuff. I really love the talent of Jaden Reed. I'm starting to cool a little bit on the situation where when you look at his snap share, it really never gets very high. And when he got over 70% of snaps, it was at the uh, dispense, really, of the tight end position. So it's, it has nothing to do with. They just don't play him outside. They play him in the slot for the most part. So yeah. that's what worries me with Jaden Reed. And I think that Keenan Allen, although he's old, I think that's probably – if I have if I actually have reservations, it's that this guy's turning 32, and we see a lot of guys tend to break down at that yeah. age, honestly. Uh, I mean, it's fair. The signs, like, I, I think you could kind of paint the picture however you want to, as, as is the case for, for most players. But I love hey. to see you getting in the snap game. Big snap share guy. Chato, Big snap guy. Chad Ochocinco said that the casual fans better learn Jaden Reed's name quickly. I mean, he's, he's just good, don't he's be a good confu- ball player. Just don't confuse that because I'm a BDG guy first, not a snap <laughs> back guy. All right, what do we got? Who's Mike, up next? It's uh, me, yeah. Whatever one of you hoes wants Whatever. to go. How about buy, sell, hold these bad. nuts right now? Let's not. Ramondre Stevenson, oh, New England gosh. running back. He, uh, we had to come back to this one. Yeah, we had to come back to this one because we <laughs> talked about him on our last episode, and then all the comments were like, well, he already got the bag. What are you talking about? Yeah, we recorded that like, like right 14 before minutes happened. before it was so, the extension. I, I was literally on – I just left the office. It's ridiculous. <laughs> let's get an updated conversation here about Ramondre Stevenson. Last year was 12.1 in fantasy points per game, 27th overall. His underdog ADP is 82. He's being drafted in the seventh round. The names in this round – uh, at the running back position specifically, above him, Alvin Kamara and Aaron Jones. Below him, Najee Harris, Jonathan Brooks, Zamir White. It's that group of guys we've kind of talked what about. What running back is he? Today. 22. He is running back 20 on uh, underdog. So how are we feeling about uh, old Steven Steen? <clears throat> we keep people big mad. We sell him. We're going to sell Steen. Sell, sell Steen. We're going right, to sell Steen. Yeah, just uh, to be honest, the extension didn't really do much for me. It was kind of weird. Dude, did you see the actual, like, details of it? No. It, it took forever whole, to come out. The whole shit is, like, incentive-based. Like, well, it, I, oh, I really? figured that yeah. it would, but it was insane how long it took to come on Spotrack. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Basically, they, like... They usually wait. That happens a lot with them because they wait to get, like, really, really official numbers because they got they got a huge chart and they got to get everything yeah. right there. It's like, I'm, four I'm, for 36. I'm about to pull this up. It's, yeah. do it. it's basically, like, all incentive-based for the most part. Like, Interesting. Somebody that I, I trust, they said that uh, you can get out of it pretty much in a year and it really won't cost them really anything in dead cap. Like it's kind of a lot of funny money. And and that's with all these incentive based contracts in the first place is like, you have to earn that money every civ- or every single year. You could, you don't just get it. So um, I'll let you kind of look it up and, and talk I, more about the details, yeah. but it looks like they can actually, I mean, like most running back contracts nowadays, they, they can get it. out after year one, but yep. there's a lot of, uh, if you cut them post June 1st, where they save a ton of money on the cap, ton. but I'll say this, the contract to me was a, I don't, Really understand it as far as if I was building a team, but I'm I'm not. It's yeah. more from the. It's like you give them that contract and you're like, okay, this means that we're like building the team around Ramondre. It's like, like you don't have any quarterback money tied up, so you can you can pay him, sure. Dude, there's ten running backs in next year's class better than Stevenson. Well, I think that's the thing for me. Like, I think it gave is, is a vote of confidence for me. What I I do think is uh, where my I give it a bump because I think he'll be given the feature touches this year. My biggest problem is I. I don't know what the hell to make of this offense, frankly. I don't I don't project it to be very good if I'm it's gonna being be honest. horrible. And yeah. the the thing about it for me is if the offense isn't great, I think Ramondre is a nice player, but I don't think he's uh overly talented to overcome that situation. Yeah. And I'm not really interested in drafting him a, of head of players that I think have much higher upside this year. That you, you name Najee behind and I'm like, all right, that's I'm yep. good. Najee's easy. Kamara being in front of him, easy as well. There was a couple Andre, other names. I, I will say Connor. Swift on a good Connor. offense. Connor. Being, yeah. being in the fantasy space for a while, I do think that there's a, there's an angle here. I think we need to leave a little bit of room to say that New England is in a terrible offense. I think we need to leave uh, the possibility that they're, you know, Last year, they were a fucking abysmal. Maybe they're the 21st ranked offense this year or something, which would be a huge step up, a lot sure. more scoring and like a lot more production. So it'll be a good defense as they are year over year, and they might want to push the game through their running back and kind of hide 
Drake May. Well, it is worth noting that their new offensive coordinator, Alex Van Pelt, he's coming from the Cleveland Browns, and he has notoriously produced top 10 rushing offenses his entire career. Mm-hmm. So what happens when you're tied to Nick Chubb, yeah. It does help. But and, and you know who uh, you know who he's probably going to be starting at quarterback? Jacoby Brisket. Jacoby. Yeah, so Jacoby came I do in think it's worth noting, though, yesterday. that oh. – they probably will have an offensive focus of trying to establish the run. So yeah. that can help. I, I think we, yeah, I th- because those types of turnarounds on offense, like the way offense is turned around is you bring in a new quarterback that's highly drafted. You bring in a new coaching staff, you bring in new weapons. Like the, the signs are in front of us. I'm not saying they're going to be good, but like if it does turn around, it's like, yes, this is the process of how offenses turn around when they do. It happens quickly, you know? So, like, I, I think we should leave a little bit of room to, to say that, hey, sure. Patriots might not be the worst offense in the NFL. They might be a little bit better than than we think. That being said, I ain't taking Ramondre. the Texans last well, year. No, I'm, exactly. I, I, say, I, I said, like, I probably project it to be bad. I also don't know what to make of it. There's a lot of change. It could end up being better than expected. But here's my thing. Even if it is, what does that look like? Yeah. A 20th type offense in the NFL? Yeah, that's what I mean. But there are running backs that can produce it at – levels of that they need to catch a shitload of passes and my biggest concern realistically is actually gibson. The, is gibson because he you know we talk about players that are like really annoying and we i feel like maybe we should do a video about like the most annoying players in fantasy football gibson uh, would be like my number one because it's like gibson. i don't ha- yeah i kind of actually right i hate gibson you <laughs> got me about as hype on gibson coming out as a rookie though as any any person i remember he was awesome coming out and he produced like a bunch of rb1 seasons off the rip yeah um, so he was great in Washington until they were like, he can't run in between the tackles. Let's, let's draft Brian Robinson. And Robert that's what he does best. He catches him. balls best. Right. And I think awesome. they're going to use him in new England. They, uh, notoriously use committees. True. And I think that like Gibson will be a person that plays a lot on two and four minute drills, plays a lot on third downs. It's what he does best. And I think he'll be enough to like skim a lot of the ceiling off of Ramondre Stevenson. So you're yeah. getting an underwhelming offense uh two down back probably maybe the goal line carries are split like we we don't know uh so Ramondre up that high feels he's to me. a fade for me in my rankings right now I, I have him lower than that I talked a little bit about it in a video but I wouldn't be surprised if if he returns value at this ADP but I don't expect him to like exceed expectations here yeah. I think that's an underrated part uh what you just talked about though when Ramondre was uh top 10 or whatever he was top eight whatever last two years ago he had a ton of passing work, and he had, like, almost 70 catches. Yeah. So if he's not going to get a ton of volume in the passing game, he's probably not an upside play. All right, let's talk about some later players. This is our last one, right? Number six. That's it? We got two apiece? Yep. All right, well, then two we're just – Two apiece, so make it your best. So we're going to skip the one I was going to go. <laughs> we're going to go directly to the same round. The 10-10, 117.4, running bike, 35, Blake Corum. Han. She. <laughs> How are you going to act? Can you give us some uh, information names around him and stuff? I don't want to, but I will. Just ahead of him, Tajay Spears. Just after him, Gus Edwards, Chase Brown, Zeke Elliott, and Austin Eckler. Wide receivers in the range are, I mean, underdogs are ridiculous, but it's Josh Palmer, Khalil Shakir, uh, Mike Williams, Jacoby Myers, and Dontavian Wicks. Flip them. Yeah, I'm, I'm padding the bank account. Mm. Sell. Sell and holding. All right. Talk to me about the uh, the extreme first. Let's 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 hear the sell case. I mean, I'm just getting higher on Kyron Williams as as the weeks kind of progress, and I think he's going to be the the featured back for the most part. I also hear those other names around Blake Corum, where I'm easily taking Tajay Spears over him. I would take Zeke over him. I would take Chase Brown is probably where the discussion starts for me, and even then, I think Chase Brown. I feel more confident in his workload off the rip. I, I, I still am not there where I feel confident that he's going to get like any sort of touches where you can put him into the lineup. And I, I don't see a world where he just outplays Kyron to, you know, take over this like upside uh, spot. That being said, Kyron can get hurt. Anyone can get hurt. So sure. he's talented enough that he could take over if, if Kyron does get hurt. But like at the end of the day, like Kyron proved to be so good last year in this offense. Their run blocking offensive line was top five per PFF last really year, good. which was a huge fucking surprise. Yep. And if that happens again, like Kyron should see a lot of success again. And I think they it's his job to lose. They also just added uh, Jonah Jackson from the Lions, who's been a really good run blocker in the past couple of years. Go. A little bit of a down year last year, but the two years before that, he was a really good run blocker. So yeah. I'm hold. Okay. I, I think Corum, I see the upside. And in a best ball format, like I definitely am not – Afraid to press draft on a guy that, with Kyron Williams ahead of him, who does battle with injury quite often and doesn't necessarily have the body to have a whole long season, and Les Snead is talking about they added him because 
they wanted to make sure that Kyron could stay durable for a full year. I, I would be dumb not to acknowledge all of that and just be out on Corum. Also, I liked him a little bit more than you guys. But when it comes down to who's being drafted above him, Tajay Spears, Devin Singletary, like those guys, they're immediate producers in their offense week one, ready to go. I don't think Corum necessarily is. I think the way that I'm viewing him right now is he is a handcuff week one. He's going to be the guy that will step in if there is an injury, and maybe eventually he gets worked into a role. But um, the guys after him, I'll take the upside on Corum over a guy like Edwards, over a guy like Zeke, uh, Chase Brown. I probably actually, going down even further, like uh, Jerome Ford, I probably actually like Ford more than Corum right now. Okay. But I think it's because I project Ford to be a week one starter. Yeah, I would definitely take Ford over him as well. So let's have a, a little bit of a further discussion on like handcuffs, where in best ball you have, you're probably drafting like five running backs and you want guys that can get into your lineup. You want multiple options that can get into your lineup weekly. So most people tend to shy away from uh, taking handcuffs. So if you're if you're drafting in best ball where you don't make waiver wire moves or anything like that, most people will not take Kyron and then Blake Corum. They'll kind of like swap. Where as in a regular redraft league where you have a bench and you're you know you're making sit start decisions, I'm actually perfectly fine going Kyron in you know the late second wherever he's going and then taking Blake in in the 11th or 12th round. I know it, it became popular for whatever reason over the last like three, five years where it's like, don't take your handcuffs, take other people's handcuffs. I like literally couldn't agree to, uh, disagree more with that sentiment. Okay. You ever play in a fucking redraft league and have a star running back go down and not have his handcuff? It like there's not a worse feeling. Horrible. It's horrible. Why would you not fucking draft your hand? I hate people try to get too cute, too smart, take other people's handcuffs because the upside's like, no, if your guy goes down, you're fucked. Like it's game over for you. And then and then it's the same people that want to try and trade your league mates and get like their starting wide receiver when their running back goes down. It's not gonna happen, bro. Like just take draft Kyron, draft is Blake. Is this for rounds is this later. for underdog or for uh like he's saying in your redraft putting leagues. in the lineup, like set, setting your lineup leagues. He's saying in a lineup. You didn't league. listen to anything I said, pretty much. I, I listened to everything but that part. Yep. Mm. So, so and he, that was that I'll, took that took a, it was la, it was mm. yapping. I'll summarize for you, Adam. Okay. He said in underdog, he understands not doubling on the handcuff. Got it. In your lineup leagues, he fully supports grabbing the handcuff. Totally understand it. Yeah, Dunk. I think I think <laughs> I think the first part for underdog for me is like I I would want to see if they have if I view they have standalone value. I don't, and they're not a true handcuff. I'll draft them. If it's in lineup leagues, I'm fine drafting my handcuff, especially if it's later on. I, f- I feel like if you start drafting a handcuff where there's players that have standalone value, that's where I don't like to do it. Yeah, it's, it's a murky situation. I also think, like, the earlier you invest into a running back and the later their handcuff is going, like, the, the easier that draft pick is for me. If you're, if you're taking Kyron, he's probably a second-round pick in normal leagues. And if Blake's going in the 11th, 12th round, that's – you're giving up no opportunity costs to just make sure that your star player is good and taken care of. But like taking Najee in the seventh and being like, I need a handcuff of Jalen Warren. Like now you're using two picks of, for a guy that's not even really that premium in like back-to-back rounds. So earlier you take a guy and the more clear that you know who the handcuff is too. Like that's another part of the right. situation where Blake Quorum is the clear RB2 there. Where yes. a lot of times you'll draft like Jonathan Taylor. It's like, I'm not taking swings on who might be the handcuff to Jonathan Taylor because it's just going to be four fucking guys who like throw in for him. If the Chargers backfield, you don't necessarily know who the starter is, let alone RB2 or RB3. Right. Yeah. So the earlier you invest in capital and the clearer the RB2 is and the later they're going to – like it's the perfect situation, in my opinion, to go Kyron and Blake together on a redraft team. Yeah, yeah no, that makes sense. In well, underdog, though, you would you would fade uh, Corum, though, I, right? Yeah, I would take one or the other probably. Okay. Like if I, if I don't go Kyron and I wanted to share that backfield, I'd be fine yeah. taking Blake, but I, I probably wouldn't take both of them That's together. what I've been doing, but I've been getting a lot more Kyron because people are fading him in underdog right Where now. Where do you get him in underdog? He's like a third round pick right yeah. now. Wow, that's getting down there. Yeah. I was going to ask you guys. I got 27% exposure of Kyron right now. Oh, man. Y'all are, y'all are I'm moving big up on there the, pretty quickly. Dude, I'm just auto third round click. click I was, I was click. working. I'm working on uh, for Friday's video was like my ideal draft strategy in underdog drafts if you're picking from like the 101 to 104. So it's in my eyes, it's, it's easy to grab your CD Lamb. And then again, on the back turn of the two, it's like you're getting the bottom of that good tier. So you Kyron can get. No, nah, I wouldn't go running back, running back. But I'm so, like, you would be able to go with your wide receiver two if it's, you know, Alave, Devontae, Nico, Evan, whoever falls to you there. And then you can get Kyron or HN in the third, in the third. round, typically. I think in fen- Friends and Family League, it's the same thing, but you could probably flip them. Where Kyron goes in the second, then you can get Mike Evans in the third kind of thing. L- last question on Blake. Let me just ask you guys this in like a range of outcomes. Where would you put it as. That at some point throughout the year, he Blake Corum becomes someone that has standalone value. 
like Kyron is out of the lineup and hurt? I'm not saying no. Like no, like like basically he eventually develops enough of a role to where he has standalone value, meaning you might consider starting him in fantasy. Ten percent. Um, yeah. Without injury, ten percent. But I think that there's probably like an eighty percent chance Kyron misses. Time. It kind of it kind of feels like maybe uh remember like Tennessee last year? I like Henry project injuries. If I had to. W. I mean, no. we don't we don't predict injuries. We just, but when we, we do, just root for him when we have. But the when handcuffs. we do, I love it. <laughs> I'm still drafting Kyron no, at 27. Uh, it, it feels like um, maybe like Tennessee last year, where it's like Derrick Henry, Tajay Spears, where Derrick Henry was the workhorse, obviously, but Sneaky gave up like a shitload of snaps to the backup, but like it never really got to a point where you felt super comfortable starting Tajay Spears. Spears. It's like yeah. he has standalone value because he makes a lot of cool plays and like based on the raw numbers, like he's playing a lot. He should, but like. Not really. You My know? mind went right. more to where like Corum kind of gets a Zach Charbonnet role, and if that's kind of what that's happens, you don't want to play yeah, Corum in your lineup. That ain't standalone value for sure. Yeah, but no, that's standalone stand, on that wire. That's stand down. When Kenneth Walker went down, we all started Charbonnet. So and I, he still I think, didn't do yeah. nothing. Yeah, he still did nothing. It was pain. Tough. Whatever. Let us know what you think of Anyways. Corum and all the other buy sell holds. Are you drafting Kyron that highly? <laughs> no. As much as me and Nick. I got to check my exposure on him. Whatever the drafts I'm in right now, as they finish my fucking... I'm trying to get it to 47% by the end of today. Adi- that feels not good. <laughs> that feels not good. I want, you to get a, I want you to get higher than Troy Franklin. Yeah. Not possible. I'm trying to get Franklin to 99%. All right. There you have it. Uh, as always, if you enjoyed the video, make sure you subscribe down there. Throw the D in subscribe. Hit the button that oh. looks like this. And go pre-order the draft guide, bge.co, underdog fantasy. Promo code BDGE will get it to you for the cheap, cheap. Throw some D's on that bit. Hank.